Welcome to the Steve Stein Guitar Podcast, brought to you by GuitarZoom.com. If you want to improve your guitar playing, keep listening. If you want to improve even faster, go to GuitarZoom.com, where you'll find all of Steve's premium courses, masterclasses, and memberships that'll help you quickly and easily improve your playing. Now, here's your host, Steve Stein. Hey, Steve Stein from Guitar Zoom, and this time what I'd like to do is discuss with you what's referred to as shell voicings for guitar players. Now, basically what a shell voicing is, learning how to play a chord that only utilizes the essential tones that it requires to get the true authenticity of the quality of the chord out. And you see this a lot in like jazz and things like that, but we can use it all sorts of different ways. It doesn't just have to be in jazz music. And let me show you what I mean. If I play this G chord right here, okay, what I'm doing right there is I'm using the notes G, B, and D, the root, the third, and the fifth, and I'm actually using multiple octaves of those notes because there's only three notes, but I'm strumming six strings. So I'm getting more than just the root, the third, and the fifth. I'm getting octaves of some of those as well. If I move it into a bar chord shape, the same thing is happening. I'm changing the order of things but I'm still getting all of those notes and I'm getting multiples. The point of a shell voicing is to take the chord and shrink it down into its smallest possible functional sound. And there's a couple of different reasons why you would do this. Number one, it really accentuates the harmonies that are absolutely crucial to the sound of the chord to make the chord sound the way that you want it to. The other thing is, is it gets you to move away from always thinking that everything has to be these big blocked open and bar chord things that you can actually have these smaller pieces that are very, very functional and they sound very clean, which is another thing that's really nice. The other thing that's nice about them is because, like if you think about it, when I make this G chord, I'm using all four of my fingers. When I make this bar chord, I'm using all four of my fingers. I don't have any more fingers to add to the guitar to add extensions like ninths or elevenths or thirteenths or anything like that because I've used everything that I have. I've used all my fingers. I can take a finger off and put it somewhere else, but the point of a shell voicing is you don't have to really do that. It's enabling you to, because of its minimalistic approach, you've got other fingers that are available, or it's easier to borrow over certain things that are really, really important to bring out the sounds of that chord. So there's just a lot of really great reasons to do this, and it's something fun to explore, and if you do writing, it's certainly something worth looking at here. So get your guitar tuned up and come back and check this out. All right, so what we're going to do to create these shell voicings is we're going to start off by creating major and minor chords. And what we're going to do is we're going to extend these into seventh chords, okay? So if you think about your theory, what we're doing is we're using the root, the third, the fifth, and then the seventh, okay? So that seventh is going to be really important to create these colorful sounds, whether we're playing blues or whether we're playing jazz or whatever it might be. So we're looking at the root, the third, the fifth, and the seventh. Now, to create a true simplistic shell voicing, what's really ironic is we're going to get rid of some of these notes because they aren't really necessary. The first note that we're going to get rid of is the fifth. The fifth doesn't really, it's not a necessary pitch to the quality of the chord. If I was to play a G chord, and I just played the root and the third, you'd get enough information orally from the sound of that root and that third to hear that it's a G chord, okay? What we're gonna do is we're gonna take that to the next level and what we're gonna do is we're gonna add in a seventh to this, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start off by playing this. What we'll do is we'll move everything into the key of A and we'll just play everything here. So instead of playing a full A open chord or a full A bar chord, what we wanna do is we wanna simplify this chord into the three sounds, the root, the third, and the seventh. And we're going to talk a little bit about the seventh in just a little bit, different ways to do things, but let's just start off by understanding this. So normally what we would do is we would take this A chord, and we're going to create a dominant seventh out of this because we want to play some blues. So I would take my pinky off, and I would get this dominant seventh sound, which is great. But what we want to do is in this shell voicing idea, we're going to take out everything we don't need, and we're just going to leave the root the third, and then that dominant seventh, which is going to give us that bluesy sound. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to go to the A, which is the root. Then what we're going to do is deaden out the fifth string. There's nothing on the fifth string that we need. We're going to go to the fourth string, and we're going to add on the dominant seventh, which is this note right here, G. We're going to do that with our middle finger. And then this string is just being deadened out by my first finger. And then what I'm going to do is take my third finger, and I'm going to place that on the sixth fret of the third string. And I've got myself a simplistic, simple sounding shell voicing. Now I could strum these if I wanted to. I'm going to just use my fingers for now just to kind of clean up the sound a bit. Now let's say we wanted to play a 12 bar blues in the key of A. So we've got an A, D, and E, or more appropriately, A7, D7, and E7 to give all of our chords more of a bluesy sound with those sevens. Well, we've got an A7 right here, which is playing the root, the seventh, and then the major third right there, which is all coming from this A7, but we've just simplified it into those three sounds. Now we need to go to the four chord. Well, the four chord is D7. And again, normally we may have played it like this, which there's nothing wrong with, okay? But we want to simplify that again into just having the root, the third, and the dominant seven. So it's going to look like this. And what I'm doing right there is I'm playing my middle finger on the D, which is the root. I'm putting my first finger on the F sharp of the fourth string, fourth fret. That's my third. And then I'm going to put my third finger on the fifth fret of the third string. Okay, right there, that's my dominant seventh. That's the C. So more importantly than learning a shell voicing of A7 and a shell voicing of D7, you've learned how to play a shell voicing of a dominant seventh chord anywhere you want to go on the sixth string, right? Anywhere. So if you want to play a G7, you'd come down to G and play it there. If you want to play a C7, you'd go up to C and play it there. Pretty cool. You've also learned how to play a dominant seventh shell voicing on the fifth string. Yes, you have D7, but you could move that to C or to F or to G or anywhere else you'd like to go. So the bigger picture here isn't just learning them in the key of A. It's understanding that the shape that you're creating is movable similar to your bar chords, right? And as we extend these in our further studies and start adding on other notes, there's lots of other opportunities to move these up and down as well to create all kinds of different chords. So, we've got our A7, we've got our D7, well, if I take that D7 and move it up two frets, I'm getting E7, which is my five chord. So, let's play a 12-bar blues in the key of A using A7, D7, and E7. So, one, two, ready, go. And again, you can make whatever rhythm you want, but that's the way this is going to sound. Now, if you were soloing along with somebody or you had somebody playing along with you, that gives them a lot of space in order to do their thing because you're not... You're not adding in all that. And again, I'm not saying that that's bad. It's just there's another option here for chord voicings that sounds quite nice. So we've learned how to play a one, four, five chord progression using the shell voicing, using sixth string and fifth string. Now, let's say we wanted to play that same thing, but we wanted to start on the fifth string. So we're going to play A, D, and E again, but we're going to make our main chord, A7, a fifth string chord instead. So instead of starting here, I'm going to come up to the 11th and 12th frets. 
And that's going to be, again, it's the same seventh shape. I'm just starting up here on A. Now I got to find D. So where's D? Well, I could come down here, or I could go right here. And then, of course, my five would be here. Okay. So really neat sounding. So that's the beginning stages of what a shell voicing does is it, it strips away everything else and just gives you these few notes to try and work with. And those few notes are the primary notes that really make the chord shine. It's the notes that are absolutely essential to make that chord functional. Okay, so now let's take a look at these chords, these ideas that we've got here. We also understand that when we're in a major key, we do get dominant seventh chords, right? Like the one, four, five, if we're playing blues would be dominant seven. We would make all those chords dominant seven. But if you understand your theory, you also understand that some of the chords that we generate from this major scale wind up being what we call major seventh chords, which means that the dominant or the seventh is no longer dominant. It's actually higher than that. So let me explain to you what I mean. If I was making an A dominant seventh chord, my notes would be A, C sharp, E, and G, okay? Because the A to C sharp is a major third. The C sharp to E, C sharp, let's count that. C sharp to D sharp is a whole step. D sharp to E is a half step, so that's a minor third. That's the definition of a major triad right there. And then we're moving from E to G. Well, E to G is also a minor third. So when we want to play a dominant seventh chord, the distance from the fifth to the seventh is what we refer to as a minor third. If we want to make the chord into what we refer to as a major seventh chord, that means the distance from the fifth to the seventh has to be a major third instead. So what we need to do is we need to take this A7 chord, and instead of playing the G as the seventh, we need to move that to G sharp. Now, if that's confusing to you, don't stress over it, because again, it's the voicings I want you to learn. But it might be a good idea for you to go back and study some of your theory, okay, just to make sure that you understand what's happening here. So a dominant seventh, the distance from the fifth to the seventh is a minor third. Now, the way I always thought about it in my head was if I was playing an A dominant seventh, I want a G. It's a whole step back from my root. That's how I always thought about it in college. If I wanted a, a D dominant seventh, the seventh is a C. It's a whole step back from the root. That's how I thought about it in my head. And it works. And that was always my shortcut. If I wanted a major seventh chord, then the seventh is only a half step back from my root. So if I wanted D major seven, it's, only, it's a C sharp. If I wanted A major seven, it's a G sharp. It's just a half step back from my root. That's how I always thought about it in college. And it was easy for me to find as opposed to finding the fifth and then counting a minor third up and all that sort of thing. So instead of having the G for the dominant seventh sound, we want to raise that G to G sharp and we get this, which is the A major seventh sound. I have my A, my root, my C sharp, which is my third. And now I've got my G sharp, which is my major seventh. And a real shortcut to think about is when you're dealing with dominant seventh chords, when all of your chords are dominant seventh, it tends to sound more bluesy. I hope you're enjoying this episode so far and you're getting motivated to take your guitar playing to the next level. Please do me a favor and leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts. It'll help the show grow and reach more rock stars like you who want to improve their guitar playing. Also, I'd love to know what parts of the episode you liked, as well as what you learned. So please share this podcast and tag us at guitarzoom.com on your social post. And now, let's get back to the podcast. When you start adding in major seventh sounds, it begins to sound a bit more jazzy. And again, there's theory behind all of that. But just understand, if you were playing a 1-4-5 in blues, you'd be playing A7, D7, E7. If you were playing a 1-4-5, not in blues, but in actual theory, in jazz, for instance, then that one chord would be called an A major 7. And the four chord would be D7 still, and the five chord would be D7. So now all of a sudden it sounds more like this. your seventh. Okay? It's a very nice sound. Now, again, the beauty of that is, is now you've learned how to play a major seventh across the sixth string. Well, let's go to the fifth string. Just talking about the chords so you learn these. Right now, I've got myself a D dominant seventh. If I wanted a major seven, I would have to take my third finger note right here, 
and raise it up one. Now I've got myself a C, or excuse me, a D major seven. Here's D seven, D dominant seven. Here's D major seven, because I'm adding in the note C sharp. So now you'd know how to play dominant sevenths on the sixth and the fifth string in uh, shell voicing. You'd know how to play major seven on the sixth and the fifth. Again, the theory behind it is a conversation. If you're not really sure about that, it's a conversation to have when you're learning your theory, taking a course on theory or whatever it is that you might need to really learn in depth all of the theory that goes behind this. But this lesson isn't really about all of that. It's more about learning what these are and how they'd work on the fretboard, whether you're doing it from a creative standpoint or you're doing it from a theoretical standpoint, okay? So that's your major seven. So we've got dominant seven, sixth string, and fifth string. We've got major seven, sixth string, and fifth string. So major seven on the A, just so you have the tab here so you can see this, I'm playing five, nothing, six, six. I'm playing the root, the major seven, and the major third right there. When I go to the fifth string, I'm going to D right here. And I'm playing five, four, six, root, major third, major seven. And again, simplifying the sound of that. Okay, so we've covered the dominant seven sound. We've covered the major seven sound. Well, let's look at some of the other ones that we need. For instance, minor seven. Minor seven is very important to us. A minor chord is a very important sounding chord, so let's take a look at the minor seventh sound. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go back to this A major again. We're going to make it minor, which means we need this sound right here, okay? And we're going to use the dominant seventh. So we've got this. Now, you'll notice right now I'm using my middle finger, my third finger, and my pinky. Some people like to just use two fingers. They'll use their middle finger on the sixth string, deaden out the fifth string, and then they'll bar with their third finger across the fifth fret of the third and fourth strings. And if you like the sound of that and you like the feel of that, go ahead and play it like that. If you'd rather play it with three different fingers, it's perfectly okay either way. So I've got my usual root, my dominant seventh, but now I'm using the minor third, which is pretty cool. Again, that's movable anywhere I want to go. If I go to the fifth string and make a D7 again, I'll make the four chord there. I'm playing the root, the major third, and then I'm playing the dominant seven. Well, if I want to turn this into a minor seventh chord, it means I need to take that major third and move it back one fret to make it minor. Now, this is pretty uncomfortable for as far as the fingers go for me, so I normally wouldn't use this. I would use these. I would use third finger on the fifth fret, first finger on the third fret of the fourth string, and pinky on the fifth fret of the third string. So now let's play a 12-bar blues all in minor seven. So we're using A minor seven, D minor seven, and E minor seven. So the sounds would be like this. A minor seven. D minor seven sounds really nice. And E minor seven again sounds really nice. Very easy to hear all those sounds. So here we go. One, two, ready, and... Go to the four minor, back to the one, four, back to the one, I mean, it sounds really cool. And again, it's something different. It's something that's not just open chords or bar chords or whatever. It's something else that you can explore and have some fun with, okay? So let's just start with this. So it's something that's absorbable in a fairly short amount of time for you to start understanding how instead of playing these blocked chords, we're gonna simplify this. And again, please don't get confused by all of the theory behind sevenths and things like that. We're learning shell voicings right now. If that's something that you need to study, I totally get it. If you don't understand what a dominant seventh or a, a major seventh is or something like that, that's definitely a topic of discussion. But try to bypass that a little bit to understand what the premise is. And the premise is simplifying large style chords for your use in a regular 
in a daily practice or songwriting elements. So take care, practice hard, stay positive, and I'll talk to you soon. If you want to play songs across the entire fretboard or play solos over different styles of music that people will love because they sound great and look effortless and ultimately have more fun playing guitar and have the confidence to jam with fellow musicians, then you're going to want to pay very close attention to this message. Because you're about to discover a simple way to play songs and solos across the fretboard that sounds amazing and looks so effortless that people's jaws will drop because they can't believe how well you're playing without spending hours of your time learning confusing music theory. My name is Steve Stein, and I'm a guitar player just like you. I've always known the fretboard was a big deal, but was kind of overwhelming. I've been teaching guitar since 1987, and I just turned 51. Maybe it's my age or something, but I never really got how some people can learn the fretboard by memorizing diagrams. And I've tried all kinds of stuff like I'm sure you have, and it sure has been frustrating. Like spending hours with my nose stuck in a book packed with hundreds of fretboard diagrams. Or listening to someone who's practically speaking a different language trying to explain exactly what I need to know in a way that I understand it. After spending all that time and money, it never really clicked and it felt like one critical piece of the puzzle was missing. Plus, I've never felt comfortable trusting that I understand or know how to do something without applying it in the real world. I thought there surely must be something easy that helps you to play songs and solos without having to worry about learning every chord and scale. That's when I dug through all my notes and discovered a shocking fact. You don't need to know every chord or how to play all the modes to play the most popular rock, pop, country, metal, or blues songs. You don't need to know how to thread all the scales together to play solos. I realized that you just really need to know triads. A triad is three notes that make up prime chords like major, minor, and diminished. When you can see those three types of triads on your fretboard, you'll play songs faster than ever before. And you can easily combine them to create solos. Triads are kind of like landmarks on a map. I use them to get from point A to point B on the fretboard, and I know when I play them, they'll sound great. Because they're part of the chord and work in any key. When I learned triads, my guitar playing improved tremendously because I always knew where to go. I never got lost and wasn't playing the same old scales over and over again. After a while, I started sharing this with some of my private students. They started getting results too. So I decided to record my exact method and show how anyone can use triads to play songs and solos across the fretboard that sound amazing and feel effortless. And that's how my new course, Fretboard Framework, was created. Here's what you're going to discover. Simple triad patterns that spread out over the entire fretboard so you'll know exactly where to put your fingers. Lots of guitar players seem like they're spending hours practicing boring drills and memorizing every single scale pattern. The good news is you don't have to do that because there are only three types of triads you ever have to learn to play the majority of popular songs and play awesome solos too. This two-hour course is completely online and broken down into short, easy-to-digest videos where I show you exactly how to use triads to play songs and solos across the fretboard. The first few videos explain exactly what a triad is and demonstrate how the three main types of triads, major, minor, and diminished, allow you to play creative harmonies and melodies. They're also powerful for playing songs because you'll learn new voicings so you won't be stuck playing big blocky chords and your guitar playing will sound more interesting. You can even use triad arpeggios in your solos to create melodic lines that don't sound like you're just playing a boring scale. I show you where the triads are across the fretboard so you'll know exactly where to put your fingers. In the last half of the course, I show you how to unlock the fretboard with the cage system and how to apply everything you learned to play over some jam tracks. This will allow you to really wire triads into your guitar playing and help you see the fretboard in a whole new way. You get lifetime access to my fretboard framework course so you can go at your own pace, Watch the videos again and again until you're ready for more. The videos are short and easy to understand so you never get bogged down with a bunch of useless information that won't improve your guitar playing. Similar good courses cost hundreds of dollars or even a thousand dollars at Berklee College of Music Online. Or you can do like I did and spend thousands of dollars in college learning what I'm going to show you. With all that said, this could easily sell for a thousand dollars. After all, similar courses sell for $14.97. Of course, it won't cost you a thousand dollars, not even five hundred dollars, not even a hundred dollars. You get the complete fretboard framework course for just three payments of $27.60. Or you can save 70% if you want to make one payment of $69. But it gets better because when you order today, you also get two exclusive live sessions where you can ask me your most burning questions about the course. And you don't have to worry about making it because they'll be recorded and uploaded so you can watch them at any time in the members area. Another one of the most important skills you can develop as a guitar player is ear training. That's why I've included my Ear Training 2.0 course as a special second bonus. You'll learn the secrets of playing songs by ear and be able to listen to songs and instantly know 
what notes will sound great for your solos. If you were to buy this on the website a few months back, it would have cost you $99, but you get it free when you order today. And if you order in the next 15 minutes, you'll get my three and a half hour essential guitar skills course that originally sold for $99. You'll discover all the skills you need to be a well-rounded lead guitar player. This will allow you to play freely across the entire fretboard and get really creative when it comes time to solo. With this course, you're going to overcome problems like not knowing where to start and end your solos, worrying about what scale will sound good for leads, and alternative scales you can use to improvise better solos than you ever thought possible. You won't have to worry about feeling lost or confused because your fingers will be trained to instantly find the right notes without any hesitation. So to recap, you get my new fretboard framework course and all the great bonuses I just mentioned for just three payments of $27.60 or one payment of $69. And you're protected by our 30-day guarantee. Truly put it to the test for a full 30 days and see if it's right for you. If you don't think it's a good fit, no big deal. Just contact our friendly support team and they'll issue you a full refund or exchange. No questions asked, no receipt required. However, I can only offer this price and bonuses for a short time. After that, the price increases to $199 and the bonuses will not be included. So click the button below and get started today. As soon as you place your order, you'll get a receipt in your email with instructions on how to access the course. You'll also get a spot in the two live sessions and immediate access to the Ear Training 2.0 and Essential Guitar Scales bonus courses. If you want a simple way to play songs and solos across the fretboard that sounds amazing and looks so effortless that people can't believe how well you're playing without spending hours of your time learning confusing fretboard diagrams, then you're absolutely going to love Fretboard Framework and it's simple to get started. You log into the course and watch the first short video, and as you build your skills, you move to the next video, always at your own pace. You can watch and repeat lessons as many times as you need. Remember, this could easily sell for $1,000, but you can have it today for three payments of $27.60 or one payment of $69. And when you order, you'll also get the two live sessions and immediate access to my Ear Training 2.0 and Essential Guitar Scales courses. You'll learn the secrets of playing songs by ear and all the scales you need to improvise solos over any song. The bonuses alone have a $438 value, and you get our 30-day guarantee. But remember, I can only offer this price and bonuses for a short time. After that, the price increases to $199 and the bonuses won't be included. If you enjoyed today's podcast and want to learn guitar even faster, go to guitarzoom.com and click the Get Started button to get access to courses that are right for your interest and skill level. Again, go to guitarzoom.com and click the Get Started button.